Hey everybody, welcome into the Landscape Photography Show. I am not David Johnston. Um, as you can see, he is here. Um, I'm Kevin Jordan, and we're going to kind of flip the script today. Uh, we've done this once before, um, and I think it went okay. So David, you're back in the hot seat. Uh, welcome to your own podcast. I'm in the hot seat, and you're also in the hot seat. Um, it's not easy to host a podcast, and it's not easy to ask questions along the way. But you did a really good job last time, so I did invite you back. Um, the only problem is I don't think we've agreed to payment on this, so you just tell me. I, I think you agreed to to send me the Tennessee Titans rookie quarterback. I think that was okay. Cool. We will we will arrange that since I'm yeah, his manager. I, th I think this constitutes a verbal contract, so we're good. Okay, fair fair enough. Um, so I think I think how you normally kind of start things off is to kind of delve into uh, whoever you're interviewing, kind of go into their origin story. And I feel like we're probably going to touch on that as we go along. But I think what I want to start out with is just kind of let the people know why we're here, why we're doing this. Why are you subjecting them to me? Yeah, I'm subjecting them to you because you're a solid host. Um, and I, mean, I was, I was there and you crushed it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, you've been on the show twice before, um, both as a host and a guest. What what I want people to get a feel for is not only like what the podcast is, but the direction and also the direction that they can take their own photography in the coming years and some of the resources that they will be able to get their hands on um, and some of the tips and, and information that they'll be able to learn as well. Um, you know, coming from my background in photography, I love photography, uh, but I also love the business side of photography. And I think that's one of the weird things about me and kind of how I do my photography business is I love that side of it. Um, so I sometimes gravitate to that more than photography. Um, and I'm very happy with that and, and love doing that too. Um, uh, now the, the thing is with me, uh, I figured it out along the way of making mistakes, trial and error. Uh, I, you know, me coming from my background, I flunked out of business school in college. Um, I got D's and F's in accounting, uh, econ and, you know, statistics. So it wasn't my cup of tea in that, but along the way I've learned how to do it and, and how to make money with my photography. And it's the most ask question that I get if I lead workshops or go to a convention or anything like that. So um, that's one of the one of the big things that I've really added in to Landscape Photography University, along with the photography information as well. No, I think that makes sense. And I mean, I, I come from a pretty similar um, mindset in terms of the business aspect of things like I when I went into college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I think all I really know knew what I wanted to do was anything but business. Like I, I would be asked, what's your major going to be? And I said, I don't know yet, just not business. And kind of in the same vein as you, I, I think we're really selling ourselves as the perfect authorities on this at this point. But I got to say that everybody learns differently. And I, you know, I started off with photography just as a joy and a passion. And then as I kind of moved along and, you know, I like the idea of just trying to make some side money off of it, you just kind of have to stumble through the business side of it too. And I'm a learn by doing kind of guy. So I, I think in sort of the same way, I stumbled through a lot of this as I went along. I would have loved if there was more resources. Um, there's a lot out there for wedding photography. There's a lot for portrait photography and the things that are more commercial. But in terms of nature, at least five, 10 years ago, um, when I was trying to get into it, there wasn't much. So you just kind of poke around and extrapolate and, and find things how you can to you know piece together what you have to know. Well, no one really knows kind of like what we do anyways, right? When you say, hey, I'm a landscape photographer, people are like, oh, so you're like a architectural landscape, like you go into gardens and stuff. And we're like, no, not that's not it at all. So people just don't really understand what we do, except for our small community of landscape photographers. And not only that, but how to make money with it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty tight niche. Um, I think there's still plenty of ways to make money in it. Um, I think some of those ways are changing and probably will continue to change, but I think we're probably going to try and go through those and touch on, I guess, kind of how to get started in this and what direction to try and go in. Yeah, for sure. For sure. 
All right. So in terms of, you know, the origin story for you, um, I'm guessing you didn't start out doing photography with the intention of making money. You got to that point at some point. How is that progression like for you? And, you know, what are the things you wish you had kind of learned earlier along the way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I didn't start thinking that I was going to make money with it. I started with photography. It was a loophole in high school that I was able to get out of a geography credit for. And so I took film photography in black and white uh, because I was that kind of student. You know, I, I was looking for any ways to get loopholes and get around with things. But I fell in love with photography along the way and kind of put it to the side in college. You know, you do college things and uh, mess around with your friends, do things like that. But after, after college, I realized, Hey, what a job actually is. And my degree, you know, I didn't even think about getting to that job point when I was doing a degree, but it just didn't fit well with me and my personality. And that's when I picked up a digital camera again and started to use it to not only express myself in an artistic outlet, but also use it to get outside and hike and be in the outdoors and visit new places. And I fell in love with that side of it. Um, and then when I started to read resources like books by John Acuff, um, I started to read and watch resources from Gary Vaynerchuk and Sean Cannell, people like that who really inspired me to be like, okay, I can actually do this if I go for it. And it, it wasn't, I think one of the things that people a, a lot of times get wrong that maybe I should be more careful in explaining in kind of my story in photography is that it took years to do it. Um, I worked at it on the side for six years also doing a full-time day job, doing extracurricular activities, um, doing stuff with my wife, and just needing needing to do it on the side for that length of time and, and building up kind of that bank account, right? Um, so I always say, if you're gonna make the jump into photography, at least have four to six months of income set aside before you jump into that and do it kind of as your your uh, uh, safety blanket when you actually make that jump and you don't have insurance provided through your job. You don't have a steady income stream that's guaranteed. You don't have all these things that you're used to. Now you have that safety blanket there. Um, so that's kind of how I got started in that. And and you asked, you know, how it was for me and, and what that was kind of like. Uh, it was exciting. And it was also terrifying to start my own photography business and journey. Uh, it was exciting in the form that I now had control over my schedule and what I was doing. But it was also terrifying because of the fact that I didn't have a steady income stream. I kind of had to, to learn along the way that you it, it it is a decade long process, right? It's not some you know, you're going to work at this for two or three, five years, and then you're just going to be sailing, right? You're going to be flying high with, with all this, you know, passive income streams. You have to continue to kind of reinvent yourself and you have to continue to, to go with the flow and evolution of how the business side goes, as well as photography and your creative side. Uh, because when you're able to go with the flow and kind of, change with the times, you know, you, you don't become this dinosaur that's afraid of change and become stagnant and, and eventually get extinct. So that's kind of how the journey was for me with photography. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And I think um, what you said about adapting is important because I mean, we're in a pretty, you know, fast changing technological world right now. Um, I mean, digital cameras was the big thing at first. And now it's AI and things like that. But in terms of how, you know, when you first jumped in, do you, do you wish you had done it sooner? Do you wish you had waited longer? Um, or do you think the progression for you personally kind of went at the right speed? I think that the, in the moment, and, and we all do this, if, if we have a passion about something like a lot of us have a passion with photography about, in the moment, you want it to happen faster. You want to get better faster. You want it to happen. You know, we live in such an immediate society 
that we want it then and we want it now. And I, I didn't make no qualms about my age bracket, you know, we're millennials, quote unquote. So we want it now and that's that's how we want it. But um in hindsight, and hindsight is 2020, if I were to start again with my photography, I would want it to take a little bit longer so that I could do more research on doing business better starting off. Now that's hard to say because I probably wouldn't have, you know, the the hand to hand combat of, you know, actually doing it in the moment and getting all that experience from trial and error. Um, but doing so in a way that was that was smarter. And when I say that I'm talking about, you know, my first six months, I didn't make anything. And luckily, my wife and I didn't have any debt. Um, we were living in a tiny house that was 160 square feet on somebody's property. So we were living pretty minimally. Um, so I had the wiggle room to be able to take my time and do that and learn the hard way. Uh, but having the knowledge from that and saying, okay, I got to, you know, you got to make money. You, you got to do it if that's what you're going to do. And learning the hard way to do that is what really made me kind of get my bootstraps on a little bit tighter, uh, wake up earlier, get to it right away, have a schedule, have a routine, have boundaries around my day, because it's not easy to work from home when you have all these different distractions. And just know that if photography is what I want to do, then I've got to do it. I've got to do it every single day. And I've got to, you know, go harder then I think I need to go with it. Um, so in the moment, you know, I, I wish that it would have happened a lot sooner, but in hindsight, it probably would have done me a lot, a lot good to be more patient with the process and, and learn the business side before jumping right in. Yeah. I, and you touched on a couple of things that I wanted to mention, because I think that, I think there's sort of different ends of the spectrum for this. I mean, you and I have, have I think both progressed over the past 10 years in different ways and at different speeds. You know, I've always had a full-time job for that entire 10 years. I, you know, had plenty of thoughts about, do I want to try and do photography full-time or, you know, half my income or something like that. And I decided a, that might take away some of my joy of it. B I like the comfort of a steady paycheck and health insurance and things like that. Um, with that said though, I think that security also may be a bit complacent as I was progressing on. If, if there's something I've learned in life, at least for me personally, I think that, you know, a lot of stress can be kind of crippling, but a little bit of stress can be motivating. Mm. So I think for a lot of people to be in that scenario where, okay, I have to make money, it can give you the nudge you need to, to sort of make things happen. I mean, I'm, I'm the type that I, you know, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist and I will stress over making mistakes and, you know, take the amount of time on things where I could have just made the mistake and corrected it twice and kept on going and gotten things done faster. But you know, everybody works differently, but I, I think, you know, a little bit of stress to motivate you and making some of those mistakes along the way, it's unfortunately a good way to learn because you don't want to do it again. So I know, you know, I, I think we've all taken photos from the beginning of our careers that we look back on and just think, eh, that wasn't the best, but <laughs> I think we also look at how we've progressed since then. And I think the business decisions that you mess up are tough because there's normally something monetary associated with that mistake, whether it be losing money or just preventing you from making money, but it's still important things to learn from. And I mean, like I said, I kind of wish I had those resources earlier on because I, I did plenty of stumbling as I, as I yeah. went along. Yeah. What, what resources would you want? Like it, as you were getting started, what, what was missing? <clears throat> I, I mean, a lot of it was base level knowledge for me. I didn't like I I didn't know where photography as a as a potentially money making endeavor was going to go for me. I didn't know if it was going to be I sell one print, make twenty bucks, and then leave it all behind, or if I was eventually going to build it into something more. So when I started out, I tried to do it very by the book. So like I I mean I think it varies state by state, but I'm in Massachusetts. I you know registered for a business license in my town. I got a, uh, a tax identification number and I kept my finances separately. And I mean, they weren't, they weren't and still aren't staggering finances, but you know, I at least have a separate bank account to track specifically photo things. And 
that's advice I picked up from just general small business advice along the way, you know, sole proprietorship type thing. And that helped a lot. But at the same time, I mean, I remember when I was trying to figure that out, there were, it seemed like there were a lot of resources that would say, oh, we'll do this for you. But I had a really hard time finding resources that show you how if you didn't want to pay for it. And so I was pretty unsure of things when I was starting off. And it took me a, a while to think, oh, okay, I, I understand this part of things now. I mean, the fact that I went through all those stumbling blocks makes it easy for me to explain to other people when they're starting out now, but it's definitely a slog when you're, when you're trying to do it on your own and just kind of piece things together. Yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make when they're getting started is actually like spending too much money on the front end. Um, and that could be, the things that they think they need to buy or, um, you know, getting an LLC before they need to get an LLC or not knowing what to put in their taxes to save on taxes. And again, you know, it, it's easy for us to say because we've been doing it for a little while and we understand those terms and we understand taxes and keeping finances separately and all the really fun accounting side of running your own photography business. Um, but when you're in that and you start to discover these little things to me that's it that's really exciting um to figure it out and see that little bit of progress year to year um and and i was thinking about this the other day when i was actually looking at uh youtube statistics and analytics is um i was looking at the last 48 hours of analytics and hadn't had the best two days of viewership or subscribers or anything like that and you know i never pay too much attention to subscribers but viewership i find pretty important and it wasn't great and then i started to expand the view i went to a week and it was kind of just like mediocre flat line then i went to a month and i saw a little bit of progress go up and then I was like, well, if that's a month, let's look at 12 months. And it was staggering the rate at growth in 12 months versus 48 yeah. hours. And I think that's one of the big things that a lot of people need to keep in mind uh, when they're starting is hour to hour. It can be frustrating, hard, difficult. But when you pan out and look at you know where you've come in an entire year, uh, it, it's pretty staggering and shocking. And I heard this quote one time um that we we overestimate what we can do in a year but we underestimate what we can do in a decade um and that just has always really rang home for me because i i want to get it all done in a year and i set these lofty goals in a year and you don't always reach them right but when you look at back at it for 10 years you're usually a lot further along in the process as you were in that one year, right? Yeah, I, I always refer to that as zooming out. And I think it's really important because I'm I'm the type that I get really kind of caught up in my day to day. Um, and it, it's almost like blinders are on. So every once in a while, you got to kind of take that step back. Um, in terms of that sort of progression you were talking about, I've heard that described as the valley of disappointment, where we kind mm. of expect our, you know, the effort we put in to give us sort of linear growth towards a goal. But in reality, it kind of starts out minimal at first. And then, you know, the more you start to see the benefits of all the work you put in early on, it's more exponential. And that space in between the linear growth and the exponential growth is sort of where your valley of disappointment is. And when you're in that and not really seeing the results, it's tough. But like you said, when you zoom out and then look back, it, you're able to kind of understand the benefits of all that, you know, smaller day to day stuff that you put in and, and see it for what it is. For sure. For, it's always encouraging to zoom out, like you said, and I love that term, just zoom out and look. All right. So now in terms of the business itself, I mean, if we're going to make it a business, we're looking to make money. So for landscape photography specifically, I don't know that I would call it one of the more commercially viable types of photography. I would say you probably have something like wedding photography, portrait photography at the top. Um, and, you know, landscape might be a little farther down the list, but in terms of different types of revenue streams, different clients, what do you see as sort of the main, you know, sources of income for things like that? 
So the main sources of income that I see for landscape photography are in a huge bracket of missed opportunities uh, based on available reach that we have through social media and inter and, and the internet in this day and age um, that I don't think is being capitalized on at all. Um, when, when people start to rank like portrait photography and wedding photography over landscape photography, um, I, I kind of see that as a problem and it gets under my skin a little bit because when you look at where you actually are and kind of the statistics on what gets viewership and attention online typically it's beautiful places and travel these amazing photos that you can go get and the behind the scenes of that content is very lacking we see a lot of photos of that but the behind the scenes of actually to get out there is kind of lacking in the uh, in the whole view of the internet and the scope of that. So when you look at portrait photography and wedding photography, you think about what their clients are, they're pretty much limited. And I'm just doing this as kind of like what my local wedding and portrait photography scene looks like. They're limited to this area. You know, they're limited to the population of this small town in Tennessee that I live in. If you look at portrait photographers, they're limited in the exact same way. They're limited by time, they're limited by reach, and they're limited by population. Um, if we look at landscape photographers, we can kind of go anywhere to any place on earth that can be beautiful and that we can take in our own personal expression. The only difference is we aren't doing a great job of photographing and telling a story of that behind the scenes process. You know, the reach of landscape photography in its minimum on Facebook right now is 22 million people. Um, so if you look at that 22 million population, what size city would that be? Like that's a massive, massive city if you think about it geographically uh, on a map. So when you look at that number 22 million, are we doing a good job and actually accessing that amount of people? And that's only the minimum, right? It, it goes sky high above that if you think about other platforms that we can reach people on. Um, we just have to do a better way of doing that. And I think personally, if you're talking about percentages of clients and what that looks like for your photography, Pretty much uh, for me, prints are a very small percentage of that. I think for other people, prints are gonna be a higher percentage of that because that's what they're more interested in. I've never been a huge you know, proponent of printing my own work, even though I do enjoy seeing my own prints on the wall and selling prints. That has just never been a high percentage of sales for me because I'm not a big art show person. You know, Kevin, I know you do art shows and, and you've kind of dove into that in the past year. Uh, but for me, it's just not something that I've found a lot of joy in. Um, when it comes to the education side, I think that's a huge area of growth that people need to pounce on. And I personally believe, and I said this, about six years ago on Matt Payne's podcast, I think workshops are in the dying phase, um, not only to look at the population and the demographics of people who usually take workshops are kind of aging out of that, and younger people are moving into that other demographic range. They know where they can find the information to get to those places, take better photos, and that information is more accessible to them because they know how to use the technology to get that information. Um, so I think workshops are dying out and you're seeing, starting to see that a lot with people doing more um, like outsourcing, uh, outsourcing workshops, like one person being the coordinator of the workshop and hiring out guides to take the groups out around the world in these places. Uh, which is another way of doing workshops that's being an interesting way to, to see it done right now and as that kind of scene changes. But also um, the education side and internet reach and doing your own courses, developing courses and reaching people with that um, it is a very high population of income and, and percentage of income for me. Um, 
And, and you can do that in a variety of ways, right? You can collaborate with a company who does courses. You can collaborate with uh, a blog, uh, Petapixel, Outdoor Photography Guide, all these other you know blog-based platforms that need video content or courses. You can partner with those and provide those for payment. But the real percentage of growth comes in is when you create your own course and you really market and sell that course, which are two big words that terrify any landscape photographer when you talk about marketing and sales. Um, I actually heard this just yesterday. I was listening to a podcast about marketing and sales for your own courses. And they said, you know, you need to marry Sam. You need to marry sales and marketing in your course. And that's when you have exponential growth. Um, so we know the information about what the course is. We're just not very good at selling it. And when I say we, I'm talking about landscape photography as a whole. And, and that's one of the things, that's one of the areas of growth that we need to get a lot better at. I don't, I don't understand why you think that a group full of introverts would be bad at sales and marketing, but you know, um, it's just <laughs> when we spend more it's, time, it's true of me too, for sure. When we spend more time talking to the light that's hitting the sides of mountains than actual people, there's kind of a disconnect there when we come to human interaction. I just feel like not a lot of people notice that light and it deserves to be seen and talked to. It does. It does. And people need to hear about it. sound crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you, so you, you touched on a lot there um, that I want to that I want to go back to. Um, but I think a very high level summary is, you know, you think there's certainly an addressable market for for landscape photography. Um, it's very broad because it's not limited by geography. Um, and if we go in just a general business sense, I mean, business is you're, you're solving a problem for a client, you're filling a need for them. So for example, I've done a good amount of art shows in the past couple of years, just sort of started to dive into it. And dude, they're tiring. They're really, I think I did, six this year, you know, and some of them are weekend long. I mean, we had, I think one of the top five or 10 wettest summers on record in, uh, in my area. And every single one I went to was either it downpoured at some point, things might've gotten damaged or it was over a hundred degree heat index. So, you know, those can be grueling and, you know, they aren't always consistent in their income. You know, I've had days where I've looked back and said, what did I do right there? That went great. I need to replicate that. And other days where I feel like I've replicated that and nothing really comes through. It's very hit or miss. Um, I, I was talking to somebody who's done a lot of these. He does landscape photography too. And I think, I think his quote was the only constant is pure chaos, which is <laughs> frustrating, but that's also why you diversify too. I mean, in terms of the art shows, you're filling a need for people who you know, see that beauty and want to put it on their wall. Um, that's not everyone, not anywhere who cares about that stuff. But like, I also had a job recently where someone called me looking for a very specific photo to put in a college alumni magazine. And I don't know that those opportunities are, are very common. You know, you've got to think from your client perspective, if they can fill a need, you know, for, the least amount of money they can, they're probably going to do it. And if you start thinking like a business person too, you're probably going to do the same thing when it comes to your gear, your education and, you know, services you need to uh, subscribe to. So I think it was a rare opportunity, but what it ultimately came down to is they had the story already written for an alumni magazine. They wanted a very specific photo right down to like the composition in the magazine. They wanted a landscape shot and then a fold out to show something else that fold out had to be on the right side of the screen. So, you know, I started looking at possible compositions for this in landscape or in uh, glacier national park where I was going. And I mean, when you get down to that specific, you're probably not going to find, for example, a stock photo that fits that need. Right. So that's where we then come in. And at that point too, you know, we can still provide a service and fill a need. I don't know that, you know, I, I'm not going to probably tailor my business towards seeking out those clients as often, but those opportunities do exist. And I think that ties into the idea of needing those sort of business soft skills and experience to try and find them. You know, I, we can mm -hmm. all 
be technical, learn the gear, learn composition, and all those are very important. I'm glad I learned all those things before I tried to delve into this side of stuff. But I have the benefit too that I've, you know, I've worked at a small engineering company for 10 years and I have to interface with clients. I have to read contracts. I have to write proposals. And I have to say that that phone call I had with this prospective client, if I didn't have that experience, it would have gone very, very differently. So I think a lot of people either shy away from or don't put enough effort into learning that side of things. And I think when you're a photographer, specifically a landscape photographer, you have to be that and something else like photographer and a writer, photographer and uh, a content creator or an educator or any combination of those things. So I think it's a matter of deciding, you know, what your sort of natural aptitudes are and either trying to go in that direction or decide, okay, this is the best way that I can try and make money off this. You know, what skills do I need to acquire to do that? Yeah, for sure. And, and, I think if you look on the back end of that, like how did that client actually find you, right? Um, because if I think back to uh, like the, the a project that I did with REI about a new store they were opening in the St. Louis area, they wanted to go out and capture this very specific landscape with a very specific focal distance. They wanted a double double stacked pano it was very exact um, and they needed it for a space on the wall in their store. Um, so I worked with them to try to provide that. But, you know, I asked them when we were talking about the details on the phone, you know, how did you find me? I, I don't even live in St. Louis. I live in West Tennessee. You know, is this, you said you wanted a local, am I local enough? Um, and on the phone, you know, she was like, found you through your website, uh, looked up a couple areas in, you know, the surrounding states. And I found you through, you know, your website that I just searched Tennessee photography and you came up. Um, so I think on the back end of people actually finding you, it's not, it's always said, like people always say, you know, it's, it's who, you know, well, I, I kind of flip it and say, it's who knows you, uh, because when people search you, on the internet, you're using back end information that you learned through the business side and learning about websites of SEO and how to rank for certain terms on your website and uh, how much content you're putting out and how much you're interacting with people who are interacting with that content. There's a lot of the little day to day things. And that's kind of what we talked about earlier with zooming out. There's a lot of the day to day small detail stuff that leads to those clients. You know, if I looked five years ago, I never would have thought that I was going to work with REI. And, and then I did a project with them and it was, it was awesome. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, if I were to look back on how I kind of progressed, I think one of the most obvious mistakes, and, I mean, and to be fair, I didn't necessarily have strong or specific goals about if and how I wanted to make money off this um, as I went along. But I think clear to me now with hindsight, the thing that I would have done differently is not just post a photo on the internet and assume that people will find you. People can find you, but you've got to do the work on the front end to put yourself out there, um, get in touch with people or give yourself a presence on the internet so they can find you like what happened, what happened with you. And frankly, what happened with me too, with this, uh, with this, uh, magazine job. But, you know, I think you have to put in the effort to be found, um, in a way that I think a lot of people don't, and that I certainly didn't. And then when they do find you, you need to know, you know, how to progress from there. Like if I had gotten that phone call five plus years ago, I don't think I would have gotten that job. I don't think I would have known to, you know, ask them a bunch of questions about what they were looking for, figure out what their problem is, and then, you know, give them a bunch of ideas of how to solve that problem for them. I, I truly think that's the thing that got me the job. Um, they, they openly said like, oh, they, we love how you're thinking. We love your ideas. If I had just taken that phone call and said, oh, you want this photo for Montana? Okay, I'll send you a price. I just don't think it would have gone the same way. So that's something I didn't have early on. And kind of to circle back to our original, you know, line of, you know, line of questioning, I wish there had been resources about that, that, I could have gone to um, that would have helped me progress and, and feel comfortable in what I was doing a bit sooner. 
Yeah, I, I, I get that. And that kind of back and forth negotiation is, is pretty important. Uh, like you said too, and I have, I've had similar conversations with clients on the phone too, of, you know, actually fielding their questions, asking my own. And I think when you ask your own questions, it really proves to them, like you kind of know what you're doing, uh, and you want the specifics of what they need and how you're going to benefit them and help them as somebody who needs this service. Um, I was super, super nerdy in college. It's really fascinating. Even though I'm a photographer, I was in a business fraternity that was co-ed um, that we didn't have our own like house or anything. We were like a business. It was in the business school like we were that I flunked out of. I also dropped out of the fraternity too. So I'm a big, I'm a big quitter in college, a uh, big <laughs> loser there. But, um, you know, it, they did like mock interviews during it. And that kind of helped me um, understand the back and forth, the negotiation side, communication, uh, not saying the wrong things, saying the right things. Uh, and, and that actually helped me out a, a ton, even though, you know, I've, flunked out of that school and uh, quit that fraternity. Yeah. And I think that brings up an important, important point. Cause I want like, I want what we're talking about to be kind of like helpful and actionable too. Hmm. You know, not everyone is getting those phone calls or those opportunities. Um, however, I think pretty much everyone has probably had an experience at some point of being asked to work for exposure. And I think it is, I mean, for those who don't know, exposure means free. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot of sort of uh, strong opinions on that topic, but I wanted to touch on that and get an idea of how you felt about, you know, being asked for that type of thing and how you approach it when you do. Yeah. Photographers should not work for free. Uh, even if you can get yourself out there and, you know, they'll say that you will you know, get a, get a feature on their page or, you know, they'll give them a shout out or whatever. Even if you can negotiate a price of like $50, something pretty cheap for them to do. And absolutely within their budget of any reasonable company out there, even if you can negotiate that price, it raises their view of value on you as a photographer. Um, so you can't be just like, pawning yourself out there, um, being this glutton for uh, exposure, quote unquote, for photography, you, you actually have to work on this. And when you start to negotiate those smaller prices, even though it can be minuscule for being like featured on somebody's page, um, then you can work up to those higher prices and you can work up to, hey, uh, last time, we did this amount of work for $50. This is going to involve a little bit of extra time. This is going to involve going to here to get this photo. Um, now it needs to be like $100 or $150. Here's how it will help you as the person that I'm working for. Here's how it will benefit you. And here's what I need to complete the job and, and do it and how we can work together to get this done. And I, I think that and and that back and forth process um, is very important for years down the road. Now, if you just do it for free, then they kind of see you as somebody who is expendable. Um, they can get it from anyone. Uh, but if you show that you're willing to kind of go the extra mile for that payment and work to get, negotiate, uh, I think it goes goes pretty far in terms of them viewing you as a serious photographer. Now, a lot of people who do that are going to say no to you, uh, but that's also going to save you a lot of time for clients that are actually going to pay. Um, so, you know, I, I've done shoots for exposure in the past too. It's, you know, it's just one of those things that I'm sure a lot of us have done and I don't do them anymore because I think people should respect and value photography for what it needs to be. Um, and they should value photographers time too. So I understand that they're trying to save money, but I also understand what goes into a good photo and I want photographers to get paid for that and, and be valued for that as well. 
Yeah, no, I definitely agree to that. And I'm, I'm going to agree on one thing and probably push back on another thing. I think that I'm in agreement on if you, you know, go back to these people asking you to work for exposure and, you know, push for payment, you know, ask them more about their job, you know, try and figure out how you can solve their problem. It does give you a sense of legitimacy and they might look at you in a different way. That said, like you said, there are some people that just aren't going to pay for certain things. Like, for example, there I was out walking my dog about a month ago and there was three military style helicopters that like buzzed my apartment building. And I looked at that and I was like, you know, we've, you know, we're near the highway. I've seen helicopters around here before, just kind of looking at traffic, but this seems different. And I just took out my phone and took a video, took my dog back inside, put the thing on Twitter and a news reporter from a local station called me. And he said, Hey, I saw this and we want to do a news story. You know, a bunch of other people saw these things. We want to figure out what was going on. Can we use your video as a visual? And I just asked him point blank. And I was like, I mean, I'm new to the news game. By that, I meant I know nothing about it. But I said, you know, I'm new to the news game. Do you guys typically pay for stuff like this? Or is it just a matter of, you know, you can get it for free from somewhere and you will? And, and he answered me straight up. He said, yeah, I mean, typically, you know, we can get something for free. We typically will only pay people if, you know, they get something unique from like hard to reach places, you know, for me, you know, we're in the Boston area, but somewhere out in Cape Cod is hard to get to. So they said they had a guy, guy out there who did work for them. Um, but he said, you know what, I'll ask and ended up making a hundred bucks off of it. I almost didn't because I just kind of assumed that it was going to be a, you know, work for free scenario. But I thought about it and I was like, I mean, what is it worth to me? Do I care about this random video of helicopters being on the news? And I was like, not not really that much so you know if i ask for money and they go with somebody else that's fine with me but the thing i want to push back on is that i think in creative fields it's always called exposure where i think in other fields it's called marketing like you can you can go to like a liquor store for example and get free samples of like a local beer and something like that they're giving that beer out for free but they're hoping to gain something you know monetarily later on you know, you like their beer, you go and buy a pack, or you remember it next time you go and get something, and down the road they've made money for that. Once that happens, it's, you know, marketing and advertising on the front end and revenue on the back end. I think the, the thing that isn't talked about enough is making sure that if you are going to work for something that is not monetary, you have to figure out how it can work for you too and what you can get out of it. If it's just learning experience and it's going to be a valuable you know experience to have in the future that's fair i think that's legitimate but you know i had somebody contact me early on before i had really delved into all of this and they were a representative from the we will say a very pricey hotel in a tourist area mm -hmm. not to name any names and they contacted me and they said oh hey we love your photos we'd love to be able to use these you know put in our brochures that go in the rooms put them on the walls in the hotel and as soon as i sent them a message back and mentioned the word licensing i never heard from them again hmm. what they were offering was to put my name you know you will be credited of course i think is the the phrase you always hear mm -hmm. they offered to put my name you know below all the photos mm -hmm. when is the last time that you we're flipping through a brochure in a hotel, saw a picture, looked to see who was credited, and then go Google them and buy something from them. Never. Probably not. So, you know, that to me was very much a, this is kind of BS exposure that's not going to benefit me. You know, it's not something I care about. But there are other situations where you can kind of, you know, go back and forth, like you said, negotiate with them. And even if it's not a, a monetary payment, it could be, something else that benefits you down the line. Mm. So I don't, I don't know how common those scenarios actually are for what a lot of people are asked for when it comes to landscape photography, but I also don't want everyone to slam the door on that either. Hmm. Because like you said, I think if they don't pay you, you know, for the first job, they're probably not going to call looking for you to pay you for the next job. Um, but if you look at it from a different angle and say, okay, I know I want to get to this point. I want to progress in a certain way you know, can I get something out of this that helps be a stepping stone? I think there's something to that. Okay, that's fair. Um, so 
what you could do. And, and I'm just kind of riding the coattails on your example here of the free exposure or marketing. Um, maybe you could do like, like for me, for example, having a podcast, um, I could say, you know what, I will do it for free, but in return, um, I need to do a podcast episode with you and kind of market to your email list in that way. I think that would be, that would be a fair way to do things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that's a perfect example of you're getting something out of it that's valuable for you and for your, you know, your business goals, but they still don't have to pay anything. So mm -hmm. that's, that's solving the problem. That's a perfect example. It's a win-win for both of you. For the beer example, could I provide just the bottom left corner of my photo and black out everything else and say, you know what, if you pay, you can get the other three corners. I mean, I haven't tried it before. It's an interesting thought. Um, <laughs> I, I would think it has to be the best corner of the photo, though. You can't. The best, only the best. Only yeah, the best. You've, you've really got to entice them with that corner. That is true, because if you get a beer sample, they're not giving you like the warm backwash at the very end. <laughs> Absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So in terms of in terms of trying to make this as as valuable for everyone as possible, you know, for those who are just starting out or for those who think they've kind of plateaued um, on the business side of things, you know, what do you see as kind of common mistakes or what do you think is is something that's underutilized in terms of moving those goals forward? I would say your ability to catch people's attention and to create enough content. Um, and what do I mean by that when it comes to photography is you need to create content that is more than one photo post a day and like one story every two days. Um, in terms of like Instagram lingo, right? Um, really, this is such an easy thing to do that a lot of people aren't capitalizing on is having this much attention back to you, back to interaction. And there are a couple ways of doing this and it's, it's a lot of different, you know, variations on interacting with the people who actually follow you because those are your potential clients, right? They're the people who follow you, who are most interested in you. If they follow you, they've said, I want to hear more from you. Um, so if you are creating content, um, how do you do it outside of one photo post? And how do you create attention towards you? You know, one of the easiest things, and it's actually the types of content and videos that get the most interaction are just talking like your thoughts while you're taking photos. And it is so easy to do. I was doing it yesterday morning, um, just was talking about, you know, being out there for sunrise and just took a 10 second video on my phone while I was taking photos. So I had my phone like this, just kind of sharing my thoughts, taking photos at the same time. And, you know, it was a great interaction post, got a lot of feedback from people. And if you do that, you know, if you're having this, aha moment while you're taking photos, just share it real quick. Now it's uncomfortable to take your phone out the first time you do it and actually film yourself, especially for us photographers who tend to be introverted. Um, but when you get the hang of that and you start to do it more often, um, you can really see the benefits of it and, and how it's coming out. Now that can, if you do six, six, while you're out shooting, you're covered for six out of seven days of the week uh, for not only a photo post that you're having maybe scheduled with your business page on on your uh, your business Facebook page that you can schedule those out, but now you're having an extra post a day with like a reel or a video or something like that that you can just share with no ask in return, just a video that you can produce that gets attention that. Um, gives value to people who are watching it and helps them out in some way, whether that be entertainment, information, tips, whatever. Um, and then the other thing is actually responding to people. Um, I, I've heard the term post and ghost before, um, and that is posting something 
And then when people comment on it, you like don't even respond. You just hit the little heart button because that's the easiest thing to do. Uh, when you actually interact with people, how often do you feel the need to like comment on somebody's post? Only if it's pretty incredible, right? And when they don't post anything back or they don't reply and they just hit like, that's kind of like, hey, I just, you know, gave you props. If you went up to that person in public and you were like, love your photo, and they were just like, that would be kind of weird. So you always want to respond. You always want to like respond to people who are commenting on your stuff. And to take it a step further, one of the things I, I'm huge on community building um, and building an actual relationship with people who not only buy my courses and um, are a part of my email list or the Insiders Club on Landscape Photography University, uh, but in Instagram too, I interact with a lot of people on there just because when they follow me, I will actually, while I'm making coffee in the morning or tea or making like cooking lunch, I'll just take a quick video message and say, you know, hey, Bill, thanks for following me. Uh, it really means a lot. If you ever need anything, just reach out. It's a three second video, takes very little time. And sometimes people think it's a little bit weird, but some people love it. And it's just a great way to show them that you actually care that they followed you. Cause that's, in, in my opinion, that's a pretty big deal if, if you choose to follow somebody. Yeah, and I think, and, and maybe this is just my attitude and, and not the norm, but I, I really, if I'm gonna post a comment on something, I don't necessarily expect a response. I don't know if that's just, you know, there's so much going on in the internet. Everyone's attention is so fractured that I just don't expect that anyone's going to necessarily hone in on, on something I said. But, but how does it feel when makes, they do? Well, that's the thing. It makes it so much more notable when it's actually the case. So I think there's definitely something valuable in, in you know, doing the meaningful interaction instead of, as you said. The, <laughs> yes. Just like thumbs up, man. Thumbs which, which as you said, in person, that's that's a great great way of providing perspective because that would make for a very awkward interaction. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. It would. So I think just the more content, the better. Um, I strive kind of my benchmark for the amount to produce. Um, and I don't think there should be a set number for like the general public. Um, I think it goes from person to person, but for me, I try to do 10 pieces of content per day. Um, and that's a post, a reel, a story, a comment, a tweet, all of the uh, email blast, a YouTube video post, all of those things can be categorized as content. Um, so I try to do at least 10 a day. Okay, good to know. And, and I'm in, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming that when you're, you're creating these things and posting these things, you don't necessarily have a specific you know, goal in mind of terms of, you know, like you said, you don't want people to show up and just say, Hey, buy this thing, disappear for six months, come back and say, Hey, buy this thing. So do you have any kind of strategy or goal in mind when you're posting these things, or you're just viewing it as an opportunity to interact with people and let them interact with you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, on social media, I kind of leave it open to them, whether they want to seek out that information or not. So a lot of times at the very bottom of like my text transcript, I'll be like, Hey, if this helped, uh, if it's like a composition post that talks about how to get out and take photos in a certain time of day, Hey, if this helps, here's my course on a uh, 10 day landscape photographer. Or if it's a business tip, I'm like, Hey, if this help, here's a free training and course on 30 day photography business, which is the business course. Uh, on Landscape Photography University. So I always leave it up to them uh, and it'll just say, you know, link in my bio where I have a link tree of all the courses and information that they can get so that I don't have to change up that link every single time that I post something. Um, so on email marketing, it's a little bit different. Um, email marketing and the people that are on your email list are directly correlated to how much you can make in a given year. And that's not saying to gouge them for money every single time. I kind of go with the strategy to space out my asks and double down on the amount of value that I'm giving them in my emails. 
Um, so I see a lot of photographers say like, here's, you know, this year's workshops. Um, and then they'll, you'll see another email in like three months. That's like, just had one extra slot opening on this workshop. Uh, and they're like, you know, a little bit ways down the road, new workshop opening. And that to me is just being like, Hey, come with me, you know, give me, give me your money and you can come with me to, to take photos in these places, which is great. And I think that's a great way to do your business in workshops. But when you're providing value to people in between those asks, it shows them how much value, how much more value that they'll get when they actually do pay for something that you're providing. Um, so I typically go, four to six emails without an ask, just giving them free content, uh, free videos, free information. And then I'll periodically do like one sale or one uh, collaboration with somebody else or another service. And I space them out that way. So it's more on the value side for being on the email list than on the ask side. Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. And I think um, to try and wrap it up, you you mentioned the value you're trying to provide. To zoom out, what do you see as the value of landscape photography? In the whole or like landscape photography university specifically? Um, I would say both actually. Okay, so the value in a whole for landscape photography comes down to me what that person's goal is for photography um, and the value that it places on that. So if their goal is to take better photos, uh, the value in that is still a good value, uh, but it's much smaller than if they're saying, hey, I want to I want to do what you do. I want to you know earn money from my photography. Then the value goes way up. like because if you look at, you know, just on our courses that we have on LPU, it's 10 day landscape photographer, $48 most of the time when it's on sale. Um, that will show you how to take better photos, but 30 day photography business, much more involved course. And the value on that is so much higher because it will show you how to not only regain what you paid into that course by selling your own photos, but will also show you how to do it for years and years and down the road. So I think the value for landscape photography is different for everybody, every person, uh, depending on what they want to get out of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think it does. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right. good. I think we're going to wrap it up there. So he is, he is David Johnston. Thanks for, uh, thanks for bringing me on. Thanks for doing this. And uh, I will let you have the final word because it is your podcast. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it so much. Really, the final word is just um, thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. The podcast has been an evolution of information and style, uh, and I'm just thankful for everybody who sticks around and listens and uh, now watches videos on YouTube.